Hey everybody, this is Simon from Insider Divers and in today's video I'll be talking about all the options in the underwater photography space. This video is intended to help you with your first camera purchase or later when you want to step up your cameras. I'm going to be talking about the different sizes and kinds of housings and strobes that are relevant for your purchase decision. I'll also cover all the accessories that you need to complete your underwater camera kit. So let's get started. So first of all, we need to decide on a camera. There's all kinds of different camera options that you can choose from. If you are a beginner, or if you're somebody who's not too into the technology of things, if you want to keep it simple, if you really like video and photo, macro and wide, all in one, I recommend you just go for a good compact camera. My favorite ones are the Canon G series and the Sony RX series. Those take amazing photos and very good video. You'll see that I don't generally recommend the Olympus Tough, which is probably the most popular camera underwater. That is because it's a bit limited on how far you can grow in terms of manual mode and in terms of wide angle. So that's why I recommend these other cameras. But any of these are gonna give you very, very good starting point. And if you have to decide between the Canon G and the Sony RX, I would say if you're more into video, or if you think that video is gonna be more relevant, I would lean towards the Sony RX100. But if you are totally on photography and maybe a bit more on macro, then maybe the Canon G series would be good for you. But both of them are fantastic options. So let's keep going. The next level is mirrorless. And this has been a big, big change in the underwater scene in the last 10 years because mirrorless cameras are so much smaller than SLRs. In the past, when you wanted to go into a system camera, you had to step to the big camera. But now you've got this option to go to mirrorless. These cameras are really small, really lightweight, and they're also a bit cheaper. So this is a great way to enter in the system camera space and get a lot more for your buck. So if we look at these mirrorless cameras, you've got two choices. You can either go classic micro four thirds or there's a lot of options now which are full frame. So full frame or micro four thirds, what is the difference and what should you choose? Well, the micro four thirds is much, much cheaper. So if you've got a budget constraint, definitely wanna go for one of those. But if you're interested in professional photography, and if you're really interested in video, you should consider going to the full frame. The most popular ones now are the Sony Alpha 7, um, which are absolutely fantastic cameras and rival SLRs in focus speed and in dynamic range. But you need to consider everything when making your decision. So now let's talk about SLRs. Why would you still get one of these big SLRs? My weapon of choice is the Nikon D850. And why do I still use that? Well, for starters, I've built up a whole Nikon range of, of lenses over the years, so it's easier for me to just get a new body. But also, I'm a photographer and I focus on photography only. Now, they do do video, but in no means are they comparable, for example, with the Sony Alpha 7. So if video is important to you, you should definitely go for mirrors full frame. But if you're mainly in photography, the advantage that you'll have with Nikon cameras or Canon cameras is you've got a very high focus speed, you've got less processing in the camera, so it makes it all faster, and the dynamic range is a little bit better in my personal opinion. If I were to do everything new again now, I probably would consider getting a full frame mirrorless setup, probably the Sony Alpha 7. Next up, housing decision. There are three different kinds of housings. You've either got polycarbonate, so made of plastic, or acrylic, or finally, the most expensive and most durable, which is aluminum. So what should you decide for what? For starters, you can get a very cheap way to get into underwater photography directly from the camera manufacturers. So Canon, Sony, most of these companies have a very, very simple and cheap 
starter kit. But it is a starter kit. It's very limited what you can do. It's very difficult to put accessories. They usually just have a single O-ring. Generally, it's not a safe way to go. But if you just want to try, or if you're not willing to commit any big funds, you can start with one of those. If you're going to stay in the polycarbonate space, I generally recommend Fantasy. I really like these camera housings because they have everything that I expect of a camera housing, but it's in a polycarbonate shell, which makes it a lot cheaper than any of the other solutions, but still providing those features. One example is the front part is not polycarbonate, it's metal, allows you to screw in standard accessories like a macro port or a wide angle port directly onto the housing, which is a great feature. Then, in terms of your budget decision, you have to also consider Icolite. So here we've got Icolite next to it, which is acrylic. Now, it used to be the best option between the cheap housings and the expensive aluminum housings. But these days, the polycarbonate housings are a lot better than the Icolites, particularly when it comes to how you operate the camera. Because Icolite still uses these very hard going knobs and on the polycarbonate housings, we now have nice, easy-going knobs that are much easier to operate underwater. So generally, my recommendation between the two is stick with the high-end polycarbonate-like fantasy. But now, let's come to the aluminum ones. The aluminum ones are the most sturdy and most reliable housings that you can get, but they're also much more expensive. They cost a lot more, but they deliver more. So how should you decide between polycarbonate and a metal housing? Well, I think of it like this. The polycarbonate is prone to more flooding. If you drop it or you accidentally bump it with your tank or something like that, the risk of flooding is much, much bigger. The other advantage of a metal housing is that you don't have any condensation inside. In a polycarbonate, you usually have to put some dry satchels in there and you still might get fogging occasionally, whereas in aluminum housing, that never happens. So these are two reasons that maybe help you decide between polycarbonate and aluminum. If you ask me, I would think about how long you're gonna be using them. If you think you're gonna be doing a compact camera for a couple of years before you think you might upgrade, then go polycarbonate. But if you think that is your solution and you're gonna use it for the next five years, go aluminum, it's much safer, it's much more sturdy, and you're never gonna have any problems with them. Okay, let's now talk about how to house your system camera. System camera is any camera where the lens and the body can separate. We're now talking about more expensive, more advanced cameras, and here you also change the way you configure your housing. So you have a body and a port, and these change depending on your lens. So because of that, I don't recommend polycarbonate housings at all for mirrorless or SLR cameras. One reason being that you've now got more parts and there's more chances of leak, the second thing is, the camera is heavier in there, so more chances of bumping, etc. And finally, the camera is so much more expensive, you should be spending a reasonable amount of uh, money on your housing. Just imagine this, if you would you know, splash out and get a Porsche or a Ferrari, you wouldn't park it in like a junkyard where lots of birds land on it. You would put it into a nice garage. So think of it like that. When you spend the money for a camera, you might want to spend that money for a housing as well. So, I'm going to discuss the two major options that are out there in my opinion. Number one is Nodicam. Definitely by far the market leader in the aluminum housing space, maybe even across all housings. They are extremely well designed, very well made, have lots of features and lots of accessories. And this definitely is the benchmark. So, if you don't have a money constraint, this is the best choice at this price bracket. Because the other brands like Sumbo, Aquatica and some of the other ones, pretty much don't offer the same, but they're at the same price point. So then I would definitely recommend an Audicam. The housing that I use though is Isotta. Isotta made in Italy is a somewhat simpler designed housing that does all the same stuff, but is considerably cheaper. It is actually your lowest priced aluminum housing out there and that's why I like it because it is a lot of money that we spend on this hobby so you can save some money here. There's another advantage of this housing which is that this housing is designed in a way that you can actually service it yourself. If you look on the inside you will see that inside are actually much fewer parts than in an Audicam housing. You actually have less chances of defect and it's easier to maintain by yourself. Finally, one thing that's really, really useful is the double O-rings on all parts, which means that you've got much, much less leak chances 
for your housing than any other housing in the market. In fact, in the seven years that I've had these housings, I've never had a leak. So that maybe tells you um, why I like them so much. Finally, I'm going to give you one thought on this. If you have a hard time deciding between the different um, system camera housing options, look at what your friends are using. If all of your friends are using Nauticam, you might want to consider getting a Nauticam because of that. Because if you're going on a trip somewhere and you forgot your uh, pump or one of your ports or something, then it's much easier to just borrow something from your friends. If all your friends have mixed housings, then there's no difference. But if your friends have CNC or Isota, then another reason maybe to go for those. Now let's talk about the light source. For underwater photography, strobes are essential. If you're into video, that's a different story. But if you do photography, you're gonna have to use strobes. As a matter of fact, when people join my workshops, I make it mandatory to have at least one strobe because a lot of photography is not possible unless we have strobes. So what strobes to choose? We basically got three levels. You can start with a small strobe like this, which got like low light guide numbers, and it will light up very good for macro. But you need to know that it will light everything up, up to like 50 centimeters, maximum a meter, and that's about the maximum range that you can get. After that, the light just dissipates and you won't light anything up. So for wide angle, these are not really useful. They're good for macro and they're good for beginners. I generally like people to step up to the next level, which is actually kind of top end already. So lots of professionals use these strobes. This is the strobe I use the most, the, the Inon Z330. These go to a light guide number of 33 and allow you to do most of the photography that you might want to inspire. The distance now is two meters and you can even sort of do three meters if you take the diffusers off. So you can light up everything that comes reasonably close and you've got a good recycle speed. It's a very good strobe and that's generally my recommended strobe for most people. Don't start with the small thing, get the big guys because you're gonna use them for a long time and you can grow with them. So why should one consider getting one of these circular flash, these big tube flash? Now, for me as a professional, that is sometimes useful because they now have a light guide of 64, so that's twice the power than the Inon 330, which has two advantages. One, I now have pretty much the reach of up to five meters where I can still light up uh, subjects like wrecks or whales or um, larger animals or animals in the distance, but also the recycle speed is faster. If I'm shooting with the Z330 at full power, which is like guy 33, the recycle time between every shot is 1.6 seconds. If, that, if I put this one to half power, which is 33, I can do five shots in the same time. So here, if the shark comes by, I can go tuck, 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 and I will be able to shoot every picture with nice, lots of light power. So that's why I would choose that. If money is no objective, then you can consider getting one of these, but I'm gonna tell you that they're not very handy for macro because they're quite bulky and they're much heavier to travel with. So it is a big consideration. Generally, my recommendation is to stick with the medium size around the 30 light guide number and we're gonna do really, really fine. You're gonna do all your photography with that. After you got your strobe and your housing decision, now you have to get the last few parts to make a complete set, as you can see it here. So the first decision is how to mount your strobes. Generally, we want to mount our strobes in a three clamp position. This gives us the most flexibility. You can move the strobes around and out anywhere you want them to be, and therefore the most flexibility you get if you use three clamps. What clamps you can use? There's lots of clamps out there, so all of these work in the same way but I personally prefer the Nauticam clamps. I have to say, in terms of price, but also in terms of quality, these actually have served me the best over the years, and I strongly recommend them. You can maybe see here on my housing that I'm using long clamps for my arms. So when the arms are thicker, which I'll explain in a moment, it is useful to have long clamps. They give you more reach, and it means the arms don't connect. So let's talk about the arms. You can take simple arms like this, which are, you know, just simple arms that with two ball joints and you can choose them in any kind of length. But what you will see are all kinds of different variations with floating bodies. So you will see that they have a floating body which gives upward buoyancy for your set because particularly if you're going to get in aluminum housing you'll see that there's a downward drag and with these you can get your housing to be almost neutral. So these guys you should go for good quality ones 
I prefer the ones from Isotta which are made out of metal because they don't leak. But a lot of these um, uh, float arms in the market, you might just not want to take the lowest one out there just because the cheapest ones have a tendency to float and take water and then the whole point is gone. Another option that you can use, I'm using on my set here, is putting up a uh, floating sponge. Um, these floating sponges you can attach to your normal arms, slide them on, and depending on what setup you can even put multiple uh, floats on each arm to get your buoyancy just right. So as you can see here in my kit, I'm actually doing a combination of a thick float arm and then a combination here. So if I'm doing macro, I'll put three, and if I'm doing wide angle, I'll put two. But if I put a super large dome that has a lot of buoyancy by itself, I might take them off altogether. So it's a way to adjust your buoyancy to the perfect level. So next we need to connect the strobe to our camera. The simplest and most common way is optical cables. So this is an optical cable that will transfer the light coming from either the strobe or the built-in LED indicator to the strobe and make it flash. Now there's not too much to think about but again don't go cheap on these. They should have a solid head here because they very easily slip out and then you don't have any uh, strobe light underwater, but also they can break. So make sure they have a good solid head, but also try to buy a multi-core optical cable. So a cable that has lots of uh, optical lines pressed together, like in a fiberglass cable, which means the transmission is much, much better and more reliable. But you'll see that actually lots of professionals, including myself, prefer using sync cords. If you compare the two, you can already see that the sync cord is much, much thicker. The other thing that you'll notice is they have screw ports. So they will screw into both the housing and the strobe and it will never come out. One thing that happens quite often with optical cable underwater is that they pop out. And it's quite annoying. You're shooting something, you're moving a strobe arm and it pulls out the plug and your strobe stops firing. Now this will never happen with the sync cord. And I have to say that although they're more expensive, actually they never break and optical cables do break more often. So it's not really a price decision. So if your housing has a sync socket, it's worth getting sync cords uh, because they actually give you a much more reliable connection and they never break. Final touches now, let's talk about focus lights. Your camera will need light to focus in any kind of darker conditions and many macro conditions. So don't cheap out, make sure you get a focus light. Also, if you're ever gonna do a night dive, you're gonna need that focus light. I actually use a very, very simple, small focus light that is lightweight, doesn't get in the way much, and is not too powerful. That is what I use the most. So it's a wide angle torch. Make sure it's not a spotlight torch, but a wide torch. And that just gets mounted right on top of the housing. And it's always there, it doesn't bother me, but when I need it, I have it. There is a reason sometimes to use a video light, but I'm gonna tell you right away, there's downsides of using video light. One, they're very powerful, so they actually create backscatter. So if you're gonna use it, you're gonna to have to tune it down to the minimum, not to overpower your picture. The other thing is the batteries run out much quicker on those. So if you keep running them, they might actually empty up within one dive. So that's a reason not to get one of them. So why do I use them? Well, if you're planning on doing, for example, uh, slow shutter speed kind of photos, it is good to have more additional light for the stream of the motion. And that's where these come in handy. Another reason is if you want to switch back to video every now and then, it's good to have a good video light on board. So if these are relevant for you, get a bigger one of these. Last and final touch is your cord. You want to have one of these just because if you're doing your safety stop or whenever you're diving and you're not really looking after your camera, you want to make sure that that is attached to your BCD somewhere so you don't lose this beautiful expensive piece of kit. Just attach one of these to the left side of your housing. You don't want it to be in the right side because this is where all your camera dials are. You want it to be on the left side and you can do it quite simply. You can either just put it over that arm because once you put the clamp on there, once you put the clamp on there, it's safely and secure. You can also loop it through there and sometimes the uh, arms actually have a little loop for it. So let's bring it all together. This is your perfect compact camera single strobe setup. You've got your camera housing and your tray. You mount all the arms on the left because with the right hand you want to have all operational abilities around your controls. 
You put your floating body on the inside so that on the outside you've got more movability when you move around your stroke. Because now you can move around your stroke wherever you want. You can have it here or wider, you can have it at the top, or you could even do a wide angle from the other side. So you've got all the options with this setup, and that's why I think this setup is a perfect setup for beginners and anybody who wants to seriously get into underwater photography. For your system camera or your twin strobe setup, it's just the same, except that you mirror what you had on the left on the right. So you want to use the same arms, you want to use the same strobes and the same floats so that there's no unevenness in terms of buoyancy underwater. And with that, you would have your twin strobe setup. So thank you for watching and I hope you found this useful. I'm going to put some links in the description below as well. If you have any questions, just put them below this video or write me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, anywhere, any of your questions and I will try to answer them as swiftly as possible. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please tell your friends about it. Hit the subscribe button below and please watch some of my other videos or join me on one of my trips.